Hi, welcome to Shift. It's PwC Canada's podcast series, and we're digging into key digital trends and topics that can make your business transformation a reality. I'm your host, John Finkelstein, and I'm also the creative director of PwC Canada. Today we have a really exciting topic. We're talking about open banking, and I'm here with Neil Parmenter, President and CEO of Canadian Bankers Association. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Why don't we start by talking about the Canadian Bankers Association, what you do, and what is open banking? The Canadian Bankers Association is an advocacy group representing about 68 banks in Canada. There's the the big six banks that everyone's familiar with, and there's smaller domestic banks. And then our biggest group is actually the foreign banks. So all of the big foreign banks you can think of, all the American brands, a lot of the European banks, and and increasingly more and more Asian banks. We need a definition. Tell me the definition. In its simplest form, open banking starts with the premise that consumers want their own data, in this case banking data, shared with a third party of their choosing. I use the analogy of a waiter. If you're at a restaurant and you're, you're given a menu with a whole series of selections that you can, you can pick from, your conduit back to the kitchen to sort of say what I want to eat is the waiter. So you place your order with the waiter, waiter goes back to the kitchen, and then that waiter delivers it back to you. So if you think about a world in which that waiter gets to know you more and more, this person has, this customer has a gluten allergy, they don't like spicy foods, those sorts of things. Right. They can start to apply intelligence to your ordering decisions. Imagine that waiter is now not representing a single restaurant's menu, but tens of thousands of restaurant menus, and coming to you with ideas about what might work for you. If you use that analogy in banking, it works very much the same way. So the data that exists on you as a customer, your savings accounts, your investing habits, the type of debt you have, an API can apply intelligence to your financial situation and show you different options or different alternatives that you might want to consider with your banking. And in a nutshell, that's kind of what open, open banking is. So if I'm the average consumer and I hear banking data shared with, the alarm bells go off. They do. If you think about the information that you share with the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, right? At the end of the day, you're well aware that you're, you are consciously sharing that information with those organizations and they're likely mining that data and analyzing it. It's one thing if it's photos of your family or what your favorite movie is, but we know and consumers tell us that their banking information is very different. And so if you think about a transition to an open banking environment, people want to know uh, who's in charge of the security, who's setting the standards, who owns and who's safeguarding my privacy. And most importantly, if something goes wrong, who's liable for that? Is it the technology company that's providing this information or is it ultimately my bank? And the number one quality they're looking for from a service provider over convenience, customer experience, all these pieces is safety and security and privacy. So what's the big advantage for people uh, to move to more of an open banking system? Open banking advocates always push the concept of competition and choice. You can get a weekly or monthly digest of how much you've spent eating out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, did you know that you spent $300 this month uh, eating out? At a minimum, that's going to give you some, some data that you can internalize yourself and say, am I comfortable with that or does that seem too much? But what it can also do is categorize how much you're spending out a month, how much are you spending on paying down debt? How much are you investing for your retirement? And so you can get a quick snapshot in a very comfortable way. You said the techn- uh, technological transformation is here to stay. We need to move to um, remove the last frictions between the physical and digital environments. What do you mean by that? This notion of removing the last frictions between digital and physical, especially as it pertains yeah. to banking. If you think about all of the trends you're seeing in other industries and what consumers are expecting, they, they color and influence what people expect out of banks. So I always use the example of Uber. Uber to me is as much about the payment mechanism as it is the ride. I don't have to think about it. I get in the car, when we arrive at the destination, I open and I'm gone. You're seeing now with Amazon Go, retail stores where you walk in, you grab the items, you look at them and you walk out. More and more, people are going to expect that experience in all aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want to open up a a new bank account or something, I got to go into a branch and I need to bring my passport and my blood samples and I need to fill out 50 pages of... No, I mean, you're, you're, you're touching on one of the key elements. One of the biggest challenges we have as an industry is that 
the rules governing banks are under the auspices of something called the Bank Act. And the challenge with the Bank Act is that it only even comes up for review every five years. And, that, and the assumption is, of course, that it's going to be modernized every five years. Well the, well, the challenge with the Bank Act is that it literally governs everything soup to nuts in banks. So it's thousands and thousands of pages long. So even when the review is open, governments can't possibly update everything. So they, yeah. they tend to focus on a narrow slice. The technology exists, the customer expectations exist, the will among members exists to move to new forms. But sometimes what holds us back are the rules. If you and I had a Skype video chat mm -hmm. and I was your banker and you said, I want a mortgage for this amount and on these terms. And I said, I agree to that. It's, ev it's even all recorded. Yeah, There's no legal value to that exchange. But if I mail you an application, you fill it all out, you give me a photocopy of your driver's license and you sign it with a pen and mail it back to me, that meets the standard. Customer expectations are evolving. And if we're serious about building an, an innovation economy, we can't hold on to things like wet signatures with pens and, and photocopies of driver's licenses. Yeah. One of my favorite expressions is latency is a killer. Mm, yeah. And I think that applies to everything. It's like we need to move at the speed of innovation. Yes. Like many statutes, all well-intentioned. So, so, so decades ago, there was a recognition that the sheer size of the banking industry relative to the Canadian economy and their kind of a central importance to the economy, we need different sets of rules for banks. And one of the biggest ones they set up was to sort of say, we want banks to be banks, meaning I don't want banks to turn into holding companies. I don't want banks buying airlines and telecommunications companies and all those, all and, right. and all those pieces. It made sense decades ago, but in all the stories we've been talking about today, what is Uber? Is Uber a transportation company? Is it a, is it a broker that finds riders and drivers? Is it a payment company? And so the lines are increasingly blurred. And if you think about the role that banks will play in your experience as a consumer when you're traveling on an airplane, when you're going to see a hockey game, when you're eating out. What we're asking of, and we were really encouraged and frankly got um, in the most recent Bank Act changes, was a recognition that there's a huge distinction between buying a telecommunications company and allowing banks to partner. And that word partner was frankly problematic uh, previously with technology companies. But in 2018, to me, where's the line? When the rules do change, we, um, we spend a lot of time trying to get government to not be too prescriptive. Try to make those, those pieces as flexible and agile as possible because you have to allow for innovation to operate within those rules. Yeah, that's a tough one because you need to sort of um, anticipate what's going to come even though you don't know what it is. Exactly. And then we get into things like single sign-on. And, yes. you know, that sort of one, well, it's actually not even single sign-on, it's, it's um, single identity in this yes. notion of, you know, it's a blockchain, like who yep. owns it. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Canada is in need of a digital identification system. Yep. And we've, at the CBA, spent a lot of time researching different models. We think about uh, digital ID as an ecosystem. You don't ultimately want any one entity owning every Canadian's digital identification, right? But what you do want is an ability to have a system where everyone can plug in and everyone can help play a role in verifying. I should be able to apply for a mortgage yep. and, and be confident, the bank should be confident that I am who, who I say I am. And uh, I should be confident that I'm dealing with institutions that are participating in a, an ecosystem that's gonna protect my digital ID and not share information beyond what's necessary for that transaction. And so that's really the system that we'd like to see. I think the big gap is, I don't think they know how to do it. And it's, I could be it's wrong. It's a big project for sure. Because it's really complicated it to is. think about all the different components to that. Theoretically or philosophically, it's a grand vision. I love yes. it. What do you think is really getting in the way of, of it? Like anything that's big and new, there's risk, right? right? And so people want to take their time. We can't purport and we don't to say we have it all figured out. Here's exactly how it should, should look like. But what we are asking is that industries like ours, energy, telecommunications firms, different levels of government do need to sit around some tables and start talking about these issues. We're stifling innovation. Mm -hmm. And what I would hate to see is Canada become an importer of digital ID systems that get figured out elsewhere in the world. Yeah, We've got a great technology community, I would argue, admittedly biased, that we have the strongest banking system in the world. 
Uh, we have a government today that's committed to a digital economy and innovation. We have the component parts. We have people, we have technology, we have capability, and we have will. And we've got a great fintech community that I see yeah. playing a huge role in that. Let's bring these people together. Let's get some of these great minds working on these issues, and let's build this. The, the issues that we've been talking about today are all centered around cybersecurity, yep. privacy, customer data, who has rights, what's possible, and innovation. And to me, a, a digital ID system is, is absolutely central to addressing all of these issues. And if we get it right, you're going to see, uh, I believe, incredible uh, innovation in all those areas. Cybersecurity, fraud, all these things are top of mind. Yep. I think it's really important to be risk averse. But I, I really think that it needs to be balanced with the opportunity, the vision, the benefit. And ultimately, I'd argue an enormous risk that doesn't get talked about, which is latency. Yeah. If we sit on the sidelines and wait for someone <laughs> to solve this issue, we're going to be left behind. You know, there's all this discussion all the time about technology is disruptors and, you know, are they coming in to eat the bank's lunch and what's going to, you know, honestly, I can tell you, those are things I don't worry about. And certainly my board doesn't worry about. I think the, the key to this whole issue is that in decades past, we always looked for others to solve these big issues. I would love it if fintech got to know banks better, if banks got to know fintech better, if we collaborated. There's a place for all these groups to play. And if we get it right, it's, I think, a huge opportunity for Canada. Who in the world is doing it well? So it's very early. So it's sort of hard to say. I'd say in Australia and the UK, you've had more of a government setting the, the rules. And, you know, here's how this is going to work. 2018, June 2018 was sort of the start of the banks and fintechs kind of playing in this space. They've had some stumbles, which they would admit, because some of these bigger issues about privacy, liability, and cyber weren't as clear as perhaps they should be. In China and the United States, you have very limited but more market-driven open banking experiments. What I believe for Canada, and I think the work's already started in terms of how finance is going to start their consultation process, I think that they're going to learn from these other jurisdictions in a very Canadian way and sort of take the best from uh, best from all. You do want to get it right. If you had a cyber issue, a privacy issue, that would ultimately kind of kill the innovation. At the end of the day, what banking really is and what consumers tell us they want is confidence. If anything erodes that confidence, you've got a big problem because c consumers are losing faith in the system. And that's that's a risk we can't afford. You know, it's pretty interesting, right? Like when Facebook allowed you to transfer money yes. between people yep. and it's like, wow, okay, so what if Facebook became a bank? There's no um, certainty in how any of this is going to go down. The only, the only certainty is that change is yep. going to continue and the pace of change is going to intensify. And so for all the reasons we're talking about, you have two options. You know, you, you talk about sort of sitting on the sidelines and not making investments and not having the tough conversations. That's one option. Or you uh, embrace the disruption as a positive, constructive disruption. And who wins? Ultimately, consumers win because they get greater choice. Banks and industry win because they continue to have a major seat at the table. And they're serving customers well. And ultimately, Canada wins because I believe those are capabilities, technologies, uh, and business models that can be exported around the world. I love that. I mean, especially when we think about the holistic experience, the consumer experience. And, and, and you know, banks are consumers too, and end users are consumers yes. too, and we're trying to create this frictionless thing, which I think makes a lot of sense. There's a push and a pull between our desire for technology-enabled interactions and the personal touch. There uh, is. Do you want mobile banking or do you want in-branch banking? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Right? The, the, the truth is new channels are additive. They don't replace. They want an ability to talk to a person. Bank branches are evolving. They look more and more sometimes like cafes. Yes. There's a kiosk, which is just a few iPads and some chairs. At the end of the day, that is a branch. Sure. And I think you're going to see that continue to evolve. And so I think you'll see the physical uh, footprint of banks, banks continue to change and evolve to be more conducive to the enabling conversations and trying to get people, frankly, more comfortable. Important to that in, in sort of the customer experience is, is creating an environment that doesn't feel confrontational. Some of that's technology enabled and some of it's person to person. All these pieces are aimed at providing greater certainty and assurance. That's what people are looking yeah. for. And, and what they often look for in a physical location is I, I want to be able to go somewhere in the event that something goes wrong. Yeah. And sometimes it's easier to do that face-to-face. -face. 
you think about Canada, it's a very big country. Mm -hmm. It's sparsely populated. I mean, you get past whatever the the latitude is and suddenly it's just rocks and trees. And then you go farther and then there's people. So talk to me a little bit about how open banking can be more inclusive and really allow people across the country to enjoy the same banking possibilities. What digital ID in particular offers and affords people, both from a government services perspective, but just as much from a banking services perspective, it eliminates that need to go to a physical center somewhere uh, and bring in identification, apply for for loans. You can you can deliver services. You can update things like driver's licenses or other go- government ID remotely, and you can use that to apply for banking products and allow people to both apply for products and pay for thing for goods and services remotely. And so again, for if you think about the the geographic challenges we have, particularly in remote communities, particularly in the far north, from a learning perspective, from a digital commerce perspective, I think there's huge opportunity and banking obviously is is central to much of that. As the nature of banking changes, Mm -hmm. becomes more innovative or technology enabled, what does that mean for for employees, how, how, do, how do we upskill them? How do we train them? I think employees are, are one of the most critical issues in banking that don't get talked about enough. And, and the reason is our industry employs almost 300,000 Canadians in um, a variety of, uh, of roles, but generally well-paying, great jobs. Mm-hmm. The truth is there is always going to be a need for people in a variety of roles, the specific demands and skill sets required are going to change. If you think about potentials for artificial intelligence to change the way risk is calculated and adjudicated. So you fill out an application for a loan, whether it's small business or, or personal, you could envision a place where a lot of that does get, get actually automated. But what kinds of other advice does a small business owner need how can you help guide that small business or that entrepreneur to grow their business, provide them with a range of alternatives to finance that, to continue to export? Those are potentials on the business side for where I think you're going to see some new skill sets emerge. The industry will always remain uh, one of Canada's largest employers. Just the composition and the nature of that work is going to evolve. I love the idea of taking a workforce that's basically doing what's tantamount to sort of manual labor, right? It's very service oriented, uh, this for that, deposit this, stamp that, and really turning that into a much more valuable, advice-driven consumer experience that's worth something. Because, I mean, I love the fact that I don't have to go to the branch anymore or to an ATM to deposit a check. Right. I think uh, the pessimists among us, right, sort of view all these big macro trends as well. You know, you're just you're, you're moving to a, a cashier-less society, a tellerless Like It's just, it's all bad for employment. It's all bad for Canadians. And I just don't subscribe to any yeah, of that. Yeah, that's the negativity bias. What, what it does do is evolve the nature of work and I think will, for many people, remove some of the more tedious elements of that work and provide them with opportunities with retraining. And I think the banks are already doing it. Let's talk about uh, this notion of retraining. So when we think about digital ID, when we think about open banking, and the na- the nature of work is going to change, mm-hmm. the nature of skills need to change also. Absolutely. I think, you know, we, we do have a tendency when we're talking about a digital economy and innovation, we have a tendency to go to the technology folks naturally. But the truth is, and, and, and something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, is there's huge opportunity for art, social science, and creative arts as well. Core to this, functionality matters, security matters undeniably, but customer experience matters yes. uh, at least as much, if not more. And design is a big piece of that. User experience is a big piece of that. And again, if you think about some of the colleges and universities we have, Canada is a leader in that space. And that's uh, a story that doesn't get told enough. Certainly when we talk to government and they, they are looking for digital innovation, they often tend to go to the coders and programmers. Um, They're surprised to see just how many graphic artists places like banks employ. If you think about all the issues we're talking about, retraining, customer experience, providing career pathing for people, those are important critical roles that banks need. If you think about a large, you know, big six bank in Canada is employing 50 to 60,000 Canadians, that's a lot of retraining. That's a lot of org design that's required. 
I view all of the change, all of the disruption that we're experiencing as positive and creative disruption. I think it's good for, uh, good for the industry and certainly good for the, for the country. Difficult is worth doing. I Absolutely. love that phrase because it's, you know, you can't shy away from the work, the important work that's hard to do just because it's hard. Agreed. Or just because you don't know how to do it. And I think that's probably a lesson for everybody. It doesn't matter what sector you're in or what industry yep. you're in. It's like, if you can see the vision and you don't know how to get there, that's okay. Yes. I am certainly incredibly confident and incredibly positive about what, uh, what Canada is going to do. I think we have all the pieces and the will is there. And you can see that the ball started rolling down. And uh, I think it's a great thing for, for Canada. And I think I also believe that success breeds success. And so if we can build a bit of a track record of delivering these things, you're going to open people's minds as to what's possible. This has been an absolutely eye-opening, ear-opening, brain-opening, open banking conversation. Neil, thank you so much for spending the time with us. It's, it's such an exciting topic and area because it impacts every part of our lives. And the innovation around it, I, I can't wait to see what happens next honestly. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I know I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Thanks for listening to this episode of Shift. You can get more details at pwc.com slash ca slash shift. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, subscribe to our podcast series. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, or your preferred podcast platform. Just so you know, this podcast has been prepared by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP, an Ontario limited liability partnership for general guidance on matters of interest only and does not constitute professional advice. Until next time.